The central limit theorem states that if you have a population with mean x and standard deviation y and you take sufficiently large random samples from the population with replacement, then the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normally distributed. Let's make this easy. What is the central limit theorem really and why is it such a useful and powerful statistical concept within data science and analytics? To find the answers to these questions, let's take a step back. Distributions of data come in many shapes and forms, as you'll have seen if you watched part four of this series. And if you watched the even earlier parts of the series, you'll have seen some of the magical things that we can figure out if our data fits to a normal distribution. One of those magical things was calculating that LeBron James was 0.86 standard deviations above the mean height of players in the NBA. And once we knew this, we could figure out that this area here represented 80.5% of the area under the distribution curve and what this meant was that we could say that LeBron James is as tall or taller than around 80.5% of players in the NBA. And while this is interesting, trust me, it is just one of the thousands of statistical reasonings, findings, or comparisons that are made somewhat easy when dealing with the symmetrical, reliable, and almost predictable normal distribution. But unfortunately, our data doesn't always conform to normality. Often through either a low volume of data to start with or simply just the nature of the data itself, we end up with some mysterious unnameable asymmetrical distribution. And this is a problem as it makes it extremely hard to robustly run any statistical tests. As an example of this, let's say we needed to understand whether the data that forms metric one on screen was on average higher than the data that forms metric two. We would find it hard to do this reliably. Sure, we could just take the averages of each and see which came out on top, but this is loaded with potential trip-ups. And if it was really important to be sure of which metric was higher, we'd want to have a more rigorous approach. So what if we could take each of those distributions and somehow transform our thinking of them in a way where we could represent them as normally distributed, or at least near to it? From a statistical point of view, this would allow us to run many types of procedures and tests where normal distribution assumptions need to be met. As an example, this might allow us to understand and assess the differences in the means of our two metrics in a relatively robust and rigorous way that we could not achieve prior to this with the data represented as we see it on the left of screen. This may all seem like some statistical magic trick, but this is exactly what the central limit theorem can help us with. So let's revisit that definition that I read at the start of the video, which was the central limit theorem states that if you have a population with mean X and standard deviation Y, and you take sufficiently large random samples from the population with replacement, then the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normally distributed. Now, do not worry if that still doesn't quite make sense, but it does seem to state that we'll take some samples from a population, and if we do this many, many times, and each time we take the mean of each sample, then we plot those means to form their own distribution, we will end up with something that is normally distributed, or at least very close to it. Let's revisit this definition again at the end of the video, and I guarantee it will all make sense. To get us there, let's run through a visual example of the central limit theorem doing its thing. For this, imagine that we've been tasked with understanding the distribution of heights for all men in the United States. The idea that we could know the true mean and the true standard deviation of around 160 million men is completely implausible. But through the clever use of sampling and a little bit of the central limit theorem, we can get a pretty good estimation for those two metrics. So instead of attempting to measure the whole population, let's start by collecting a random sample from the population consisting of 40 men. We take each of the 40 men and we measure their height. Once we've taken the height of all 40, we calculate the average or mean height for that sample. And let's say this turns out to be 174 centimeters. We then take another random sample of 40 men from the population. Just like the first sample, we measure each of those 40 men and we calculate the mean height of the sample, which let's say this time turns out to be 180 centimeters. At this point, we've measured two samples and therefore we have two sample means. If we were to plot these two sample means, it would look like this. Not much to write home about, let's be honest. But as we obtain more and more random samples from the population and then plot those sample means, watch what starts to happen at 10 sample means, at 25 sample means. 
at 50 sample means and at 100 sample means. The more samples we take, just like the central limit theorem said, the closer and closer this distribution of sample means gets to a true normal distribution. How cool is that? Now, something important to note is that none of this is to say that the full population that we're sampling from, so the heights of all men in the US, is definitely normally distributed. We don't know the actual distribution of that full population, and that's the reason we're sampling in the first place. This very point is what makes the central limit theorem so interesting, because it doesn't actually matter what the underlying distribution is. The distribution of the sample means will always tend towards a normal distribution. If we were taking sample means from a population that was normally distributed, the distribution of the sample means will tend towards normal, provided of course we collect and measure enough samples. But imagine if our underlying distribution wasn't in any way normal, it was instead say a uniform distribution. If we take many samples from this uniform distribution and plot the means of each of the samples, this actually still tends towards normal. What about this? unnamed asymmetrical distribution. You guessed it, the distribution of the sample means will still tend toward normal, provided we have an adequate number of samples. And what is quite amazing is that this logic will hold for any underlying distribution, at least any distribution where we can calculate a mean. Now, one final thing before we wrap up on this video, I want to touch on a sampling concept known as bootstrapping. In our earlier example around the heights of men in the USA, we ended up needing around 100 samples of 40 men before we ended up with a distribution that looked somewhat normal. Now, this would still require us to go out and find and then measure 4,000 men, which would no doubt be a fairly time-consuming and expensive task. Another way we could have tackled this is through a process called bootstrapping or bootstrap sampling. Here, we would start with a random sample from the population, say 400 men, and from that sample, we are gonna randomly select a smaller subsample of 40 men. Like before, we calculate and record the mean height for that subsample. These 40 men would then go back into the pot, available to be selected again if randomly chosen. This process of putting back each subsample to be available for selection again is known as sampling with replacement, and we saw that in the definition for the central limit theorem. Once they are indeed back in the pot, we then take a second random sample of 40 men and calculate their mean or average height. Each time we do this, the random subsample of 40 will contain a new combination of men. Some will be different from the previous sample, and because we're sampling with replacement, some may appear in both. Again, we put the latest 40 men back into the pot and we continue to repeat this sampling process as many times as we like. The hard work here is often done by a computer, so we could pretty easily ask for something like 10,000 random subsamples and each would have a slightly different mix of men and therefore a slightly different sample mean. We can plot the distribution of those 10,000 sample means and again, enable ourselves the perks of meeting normal distribution assumptions. So to finish, let's quickly revisit our definition and see if it all makes sense. So the central limit theorem states that if you have a population with mean x and standard deviation y, so this essentially just requires us to be starting with some population where a mean can be calculated. If we take sufficiently large random samples from the population with replacement, so a couple of bits here, firstly we need to take random samples and we do that sampling with replacement. So we saw that a moment ago when talking about bootstrapping, it's where we put the members of a sample back each time, giving them the potential of reselection in a subsequent sample. And secondly, it says that random samples need to be sufficiently large. Often you'll hear sample size should be at least 30 for the central limit theorem to hold, but this is really nothing more than a rule of thumb. There will be times where your samples need to be much larger than that. Anyway, if we do all of that, it says that the distribution of the sample means, so remember this is all about us making a new distribution made up of the means of each of our samples, will be approximately normally distributed. So we saw that earlier too. The more sample means we have, the closer and closer we get towards normality. So there we go. Hopefully that has helped you grasp the central limit theorem. I think it is an extremely cool concept and I am always, always fascinated by how it works. In the next video, we are gonna take a look at another way to think about and address uncertainty. In this case, we will be discussing confidence intervals. I cannot wait to run through this with you, so I will see you there.